to this video. Here we will talk a bit about story, some design parts and meta techniques. Let's start with stories. What is a story? Let's break it down into a very simple version and the part that it contains. So, story parts. To have a story, you need some type of environment context that we're in. You need character or characters. You need some kind of problem conflict. And finally, a solution ending. So if these are the parts, then how do you build your story? One of the simpler descriptions I have ever seen is the one of an orca. So first you see the big jaw that catches your attention. And then there is a lot of body. And then there is a tail that whips up the ending with a big splash. And how to build your story and give it a structure can be called a dramaturgical model. And there are many different ones from different parts of the world. And one of the more famous dramaturg dramaturgical models is the dramatic arc or the dramatic pyramid. The concept of the dramatic arc as we know it today was created by Gustav Freytag, a German novelist and playwright who closely analyzed ancient Greek writings along with William Shakespeare's five act plays. And in this model, you start out with an exposition, the beginning of the story. You then have a rising action where you create tension by raising the stakes until you reached a climax. And after the climax, but before the end, you have a falling action where you see the consequences of the climax. And then into denouement where you tie up any loose ends and get the resolution. So this means you would have five acts. And sometimes the climax is also called drama dramatic turning point of the story. But they can actually happen at different times, times, even if that is not something we can see here in Freitag's model. There are many more dramaturgical models, like the three-act model with a beginning, a middle and an end, almost like uh, the Orca one. And we won't have time to go through loads of them, but when talking about stories, there is of course one thing we cannot miss to mention. And that is the hero's journey, also called the monomyth. It's how to write a story about coming of age, where the hero moves from the known, the ordinary world, to the unknown, the special world, and then back again. The first version was created by Joseph Campbell and have 17 stages. And there have been other versions and I will here use Vogler's version with 12 stages. The hero's journey is very uh, well used and you can recognize it in many stories and movies. For example, in Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Jane Eyre, Wizard of Oz, Rocky, Finding Nemo, Hercules and so on. And some would also say that the Bible fits in here. But we will here go through it by applying it to the Lion King, which also actually has a great example of how the dramatic turning point and the climax don't have to be at the same place. So we start out with the step one, the ordinary world. That is the hero in their everyday life. So we see Simba being born and living his life as a kid. The next step is call to adventure, the initiating incident of the story. And here that would be when Simba decides to go to the elephant graveyard. The next step is the refusal of the call. The hero experiences some hesitation to answer the call. So um, here it will be regret wanting adventure when his dad, Simba's dad Mufasa dies and his uncle Scar blames him for the death of his father. The next step is meeting with a mentor. 
The hero meets someone that will help guide them through the unknown and gains the supplies, knowledge and confidence needed to commence the adventure. Sometimes this is just where the mentor is introduced, uh, but the hero won't actually gain things until later. And in The Lion King, that is Rafiki, the monkey. And we see him here grieving, thinking he has lost both, both Mufasa and Simba. So in this version, Simba isn't gaining anything yet. Next step is crossing the first threshold. This is where the hero commits wholeheartedly to the adventure. They leave what they have always known and realize they can't go back. This is where Simba decides to run away from home. Next up is test allies and enemies. The hero explores the unknown world, faces trial and makes friends and enemies. And the trial here is to survive the desert and the new friend he, friends, friends he gains are Timba, uh, Timba, Timon and Pumbaa. And the enemies are Scar and the hyenas. The next step is approach to the innermost cave. The hero nears the center of the story and the special world. The hero faces the issue that sent them on the journey, but are not ready to handle it yet. This is shown in The Lion King when Nala arrives and tells about what has happened with their home. Next step is the ordeal. The hero faces the greatest challenge yet and experiences death and rebirth. Nala confronts Simba about being the king, but he refuses to go with her and take his rightful place. Everything looks pretty dark at this place. So this is representing the death. But this is also where the rebirth happens. And this is the turning point of the story. Here something changes. So Simba, with the help of Rafiki, the mentor, finds the courage to stand up and face his fear. Fear. So this is where the story changes, where he actually wants to do something differently. So that's why it's the turning point. And the next step is the reward. The hero experiences the consequences of surviving death. And in this case, Simba gets closure with his dead father through a dream sequence or whatever you want to call it. The next step is the road back. The hero returns to the ordinary world and continues uh, an ultimate destination. And in this case, it's very clear. It's Simba returning to Pride Rock. Next step is res the resurrection. The hero experiences a final moment of death and rebirth. So they are pure when they re-enter the ordinary world. So Simba fights Scar and stands up against him. And finally confront him about who actually killed Mufasa and dethroned him. And this, this is the climax. So the turning point was when he decides to go back. So the story changes direction, but the climax is when he actually wins over Scar. The next step, the last step, is the return with the elixir. The hero returns with something to improve the known world. In this case, it's Simba taking his place as the king. But he is now changed. He has taken the elixir. He is not the same Simba that once left, because now he has grown up. So as you can see, the Lion King follows this structure very closely. And if you hadn't heard about the hero's journey before, I'm sorry, I might have changed how you view some of your favorite stories and spoiled future stories and movies for you. So with this dramatic ending, it's time to move on to a different type of storytelling. Interactive stories. And these are common in choose your own adventure books, visual novels, uh, you choose on Netflix um, and digital games. So here you want the player or reader, depending on how you see it, to be able to make choices that affect the story. 
But as a designer, this leads to some problems. Often we design interaction trees where you start with one question and then you get to make a choice of, let's say, three answers. So it branches out and then you get a new one and a new one and a new one and so on. So if we look at the tree here in the picture, it quickly branches out and becomes pretty huge. So that means it's a lot of work for the designer and the player reader only gets to experience very little of this. And the solution for this design problem, that is what is called the diamond. So you here diverge, but then you go back in again. So you pick out the most important parts and work with them as nodes. And then in the end, you can diverge into different endings. And what is important here is that no matter what road or branch you follow, it should lead to an interesting and coherent story. You want to have a dramatic curve no matter what choice you make. And talking about choices, each choice needs to feel meaningful. No matter if it actually is or not, it should feel like it is. I have played some visual novels where you get choices like do you want to wear a blue or a red sweater for your first day at school? To be honest, that doesn't feel very meaningful. And then it might turn out that if you pick the wrong one, you will be bullied. So it has a huge effect on the story. But for me as a player, it only feels random and therefore it doesn't feel like a meaningful choice. It just takes away my sense of agency. And talking about agency, Let's move on and talk about co-creative stories. And here we find our role-playing games, both pen and paper ones, LARPs, and also some types of improv theater. And what's the difference between these stories and the other ones? Let's go back to the basic story parts. So this is how we started out with defining a story. We had environment context, we had character, problem, conflict, and solution ending. I would say that based on this very simple description, then co-creative stories would probably look a bit more like this. You take away the solution ending because you leave that up to the players. They decide that part. And of course, this isn't, isn't the whole story, pun intended, but this is a model and models are simplified. You usually decide more than just the ending. Um, and another important thing with co-creative stories is that there isn't just one protagonist, one hero. Everyone should feel like the hero in their story. And I like this quote here by John Steinbeck. If a story is not about the hero, he will not listen. And I here make a rule. A great and interesting story is about everyone, or it will not last. And not only do we have many protagonists in co-creative stories, there are also many storytellers, and often there are many stories going on at the same time. So co-creative stories are more emergent and slightly more chaotic than the other ones. And by now, you already know some about how to design for this from the previous course. But I want us to move on and take a closer look at some of the more specific parts. So here, we will instead start talking about design parts. So let's start out with modules, sometimes called mods. And a module can actually be different things, and I want to highlight that a bit. So it can either, when you say modules, mean uh, a full scenario. So this is like when you create your own adventure to Dungeons and Dragons. Then Dungeons and Dragons is the game and the adventure becomes a scenario. And when it's used like this, you can hear it being talked about something like, I bought this great mod to Call of Cthulhu. But it could also be used about creating a shorter storyline that you can plug in or take away from an existing design. 
And then you are probably saying that you are designing modular. So the different parts could be added at many different places and moved around if needed. For example, when designing EduLARP for schools, uh, we often had extra quests that could be added or taken away depending on the time frame we got from the school and or the needs of the player group. So if the group solved quests super fast, I could throw in extra backup ones. Or if we had some players that weren't really that into this type of play that we were doing, then I could whip out a game of uh, Nine Men's Morris, the board game, and incorporate that so they had something to do. But modules can also be used for changing an existing design. And this is sometimes also called a hack or a homebrew when you talk about tabletop. So for example, taking away a mechanic you don't like and changing it into something else or changing the design because of the location or numbers of players. Or when you take an existing game to use as a role-playing game in education, but change parts of the design so it actually works with your learning goals. And you could say that probably like, this is a mod of game X that is made to be playable with only two groups instead of five. Designing for control. We talked about in the previous course that it is possible to design for control and to be able to steer what will happen in the game through a design. And now it's time for some examples of how you can do this. So I want to start out by talking about fate play and railroading, which is almost the same thing on an individual versus a game level. So fate play is when you give each character a fate that the player needs to make sure happens during play. So it could be something like before the second night is over, you will have told the princess that you love her. But it could also be something to just help with setting the mood, like during play, you will make two other characters cry. And then exactly how to do this is up to the players. Outside of their fate, the players are allowed to improvise and play as they like. And then we have railroading. And that is when the LARP is very scripted and the story is more or less already decided. The players will be able to make their interpretation of the story, but they won't really be able to change it. An extreme version of this would be the LARP, uh, a silent dinner with a family, where the groups in the LARP are each given a theater play that they will play out during the LARP. Then during the LARP, you will have all of these plays happening at the same time. And the characters will have a chance to interact with characters from the other plays, but it, it won't actually change their story. So if you are playing Julie in the play Miss Julie, you will have a rom romance with the servant Sean and try to run away and then kill yourself at the end, no matter. And the reason I put these together is that, that the extreme version of the railroaded LARP as described here can be seen as a version of fate play with full transparency. Then you can, of course, have railroaded designs that are not transparent as well. Then we have working with short scenes. So designing a scenario with many short scenes is also a way to steer. Then the players probably won't have time to go too far off in any direction you didn't plan for. And it's easier to keep the story on track. And this can also be combined with giving prompts for how a scene will start or end. And here you give the player group a prompt like um, the scene will start with all the players just arriving at the classroom just to find that no one else is there. The scene will then end when someone says maybe we should go ask in the teacher's hall. And this also works very well combined with fate play. Then you can have a prompt that the scene will end when someone 
throws a glass at the floor and then have one character that has a fate that is when someone mentions that they saw your husband with Eliza at a cafe, you will throw your glass at the floor and storm out. And then of course you would have another player have as their fate that in the scene they will loudly comment on how popular the new cafe seems to be since everyone seemed to go there. I mean, just yesterday you even saw the very strict Edward sitting there together with Eliza. The next bullet point doesn't have the best name, but this is what I came up with. Um, deciding parts, but not all. So this would be when you decide, for example, that there has been a theft and someone is the thief to make sure that uh, that is part of your design. But it's not decided who the thief is or why they stole the thing. This is something that will come out, come out in play. Or if you are working with NPCs, it might be that the thief will be whomever the most player guess that it is. And then you just have to go with that and come up with a reason. Another pretty common way to work is designing it into the characters, what they think about a certain key element. And this is often done to create conflict or tension. One way um, Livverkstaden and Livbyrån uh, that I work with uh, used to this in Edularps is uh, how they used it in the LARP called Snapphane which was uh, an edgy larp about what it means to be brave. And here uh, the major conflict in this larp is that all the characters um, need to relate to this one major thing. So we have two sides where we have the oppressive government and then we have the opposition, Snapponana, which could be seen as terrorists or freedom fighters, depending on whom you asked. And both sides used violence and power as a mean to get what they want. So all characters created were then placed on a scale related to where they stood in this conflict. Some would have a clear side they sympathized with, and others thought that, you know what, both are just as bad. And we also had some that didn't really know what to think. And this spread made sure that there would be discussion and that not everyone would agree. And then you can also have some overarching rules outside of the game. So for example, in Snapana that we just talked about, there is a rule that this is not a game about revolution. This is not the story we will tell. Other examples could be uh, no one will die the first day or if someone points a gun at you, they will steer the story and you will accept whatever they say. Or uh, the first day will focus on togetherness and then the second day we will focus on conflict. And the last thing on my list here for now is add new information as the game plays. And once again, I will use Snapana here as an example. A bit into the game, when the characters are trying to find out if one among them has hidden one of the leaders of the opposition group in the house where they all live, the game master facilitator will enter the scene with a surveillance list that has info about all the characters on it. Things like Lisa have a relative that has been convicted for being part of a snap on a cell. Or George. As the janitor, he has the keys to all the house's common areas. And he has been seen moving around the house at very strange hours. This way you can direct the suspicions or just give the players more to work with depending on your needs. Important here is to make sure that your players don't feel that you fully take away their agency, both in how they see their characters and how they can play. You want to steer, not to force. And then 
there is one more way that I haven't put on the list because it's it's very effective but it's also slightly different and that is restrictions because some of the points here can be seen as restrictions and using restrictions in different ways will also help you steer the play so I mean in one way fate play is a type of restriction that you have to make sure this happens but it could also be things like each character can only use their magic ability once during the run to make them really think about when to use it and not make it a crazy magic bonanza or it could be as a design choice that the players are not allowed to speak during the game and only can make sounds to interact so these are some different ways to design for control and now i want to talk a bit to you about a physical versus mental challenge in your game do you want your players to have a physical or a mental challenge or both should the players pretend to be scared or should they actually be scared do you want your players characters to be scared or do you want the players to be scared there are pl players that like one of them but not the other but no matter how you choose be clear about it before i for example i'm a useless role player when i'm cold because then i just get tired and i have no energy there are also a number of players that absolutely shouldn't be hungry when role playing because they get snappy and ill-tempered Ill in a way that can destroy the game for others on the other hand, there are players who love to get there, to get physically exhausted, cold and tired as part of a LARP uh, or a role playing game because it heightens their experience of immersion and they don't have to put a lot of energy into pretending to be tired because they can just be tired and put their energy into playing their characters, emotions and experiences instead. Now we will move on to the third part. So now we will talk about meta techniques. One of the more well-known meta techniques is the monologue. So here a player will hold a monologue, which is partly or completely outside of the fiction space and time. It could be prompted by a game master or it come, could come from the player themselves. So for example, a facilitator can ask a player, give us a monologue on what your character is feeling right now. But what actually is a meta technique? There are many definitions and I want to share some of them with you. So nordiclarp.org has a definition that is rules, narrative tools, which are carried out by players rather than characters, but that still is part of the improvisational flow. Next, we have Peter Carlson's definition. A technique that gives more information about the story events to the player than that they get through the experiences of their characters and communication in the LARP between the participants when the same thing is not communicated between their characters. Then we have uh, what was discussed in the LARP writers uh, winter retreat in 2014. Uh, that I was part of and we had a huge discussion about this for days it was very interesting and what came out of that was a formal non-representational action within the diegesis and I'm going to break this down a bit for you so formal is defined here as meaning pre-agreed by the players but it has also kind of, we discussed it like it's maybe not always pre-agreed for that specific LARP. It could be implicitly agreed if someone starts using a meta technique that is very well known from a different LARP. And then uh, non-representational was defined as something that is not representing something else in the fiction. So for example, Using a buffer sword for combat, that is a representation of an actual sword. So that's a representational technique, just like using vinegar to represent poison in a game. 
and within the diegesis meant uh, that you wouldn't fully break the game to do the action. So the long way would maybe be to say this as an agreed upon action that isn't representing anything within the game, where the action itself happen without breaking the game. And then finally, I also want to share with you Lizzie Stark's definition. A meta technique is the specific type of mechanic or technique used in freeform role playing games and LARPs. Meta techniques let players communicate with one another about their characters within a liminal space that is neither fully in game nor out of game. When used skillfully, meta techniques let players suggest playable scene hooks to others and add an enjoyable layer of drama dramatic irony to the proceedings. So as you can see, there are many definitions and you might like some of them better than others, but hopefully this gives you somewhat of an idea about what a meta technique is. So let's instead talk a bit about why we would use meta techniques and how they can be used. So here uh, I will also use a number of examples of meta techniques and then you can of course go back here to the list and see if they fit the different uh, definitions. So uh, the Nordic LARP wiki says that the reason for using meta techniques is most often to provide players with information that they would not be able to ga gather while playing their characters. This could, for example, be information provided by other players about their characters, directions from a game master, or additional story outside the game's time and space. The ultimate goal of this is commonly to increase the emotional energy of play and increase the dramatic potential. And I actually think that covers it pretty well, but I would also add that it can be used to steer play and to make suggestions for play. So let's look at the how. It can be used between players. So then it's used to convey information uh, between players during play. For example, at Just a Little Loving, they used a pink feather and that was a way to give information from me as a player to the other player that I would like to play a scene with you that has sexual content. But the characters will ignore the feather. So I could walk up to another character and say, would you like to have a cup of tea with me? And I would give a pink feather. Then the other player could say, I would love to and not take the pink feather, which means I would love to play this scene with you, but I don't want to play on sexual content. Or they could say, yes, I would love to and take the feather. And then of course they want to play on that. Or they could say, no, I really don't like the tea. That's gross. And they can take the feather and say, but maybe uh, I can call you later. And then they show that they are interested in this type of play with me, but not in that type of scene. Another way to use this is the technique called ping the glass. And here the players will have one experience, but the characters will have another. So in uh, the short game, uh, Joachim, a LARP that is about uh, this guy, Joachim, uh, who's part of a class and uh, they have a reunion party and he isn't there. And during this reunion, you can use ping the glass. So you stand up and you uh, take a glass and you ping it like you're gonna hold a toast. So, and then you start saying, oh dear everyone. And then instead of actually holding a toast, you share your strongest memory of Joachim, which could be a happy one or a really sad and horrible one. So the players get to hear a memory from you and get to get a better picture of Joachim, while the characters, they actually hear a toast. So to signal that you're done, you start with saying, cheers, and everyone cheers and just keep going as if it just was a really good speech. Then we have 
from character to player. So this could be many different types of monologues, like thought bubbles. So we are sitting on a date, talking in game, and all of a sudden I do a little thought bubble. And I open it and I say, I am so bored right now. I wonder if I remember to turn off my stove at home. And did I actually look closely at that video she talked about? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, this is super nice. Please um, keep tell me more about that vacation. So then I can convey that my character is actually bored out of their lives, but they're pretending to have a good time to you as a player. And then you can do whatever you want to with that. This can also be used from uh, the game master to the players. So it could be that when you hear the sound of a gong, that means it's a new day. And then the game master during the game can go boom, and then it's a new day. It can also be used for additional story. An example here would be the meta box. So that is um, where you go into another room maybe, or if you have taped out an actual square on the floor. And in there you will play out things like time jumps, dreams, hopes. It can be things that are to come, that have happened or that never will happen. And then when you step out of the box or out of the room, you're back in the ordinary game. And it can also be used for deepening the player's relation to their own character and or story. So one technique that could be used here is what is known as shadows. So a player will, a person will follow the player around and can interact on an in-game or and meta level with the player. So the shadow can, for instance, portray the player's conscience or voices in the player's head. And as such, the shadow does not exist to other, uh, for other players. Or it could be something semi-real, like a possessing spirit or a guardian angel. And then the shadow may or may not exist for other players. So, we have now covered story. So we started out with some Western storytelling. We talked about the different parts of a story, about a dramaturgical model, the dramatic arc, Freitag's pyramid and the hero's journey. Then we talked about interactive stories, about branch structure, about the diamond and about meaningful choices. Then we went into co-creative stories, talking about not having a main character, about having more agency and that it can be a bit more chaotic. In the design specific parts, we talked about modules, about designing for control, and about physical versus mental challenges. And in this last part, we have talked about meta techniques, about what they are, why we do them, and how to do them. So this was all for this video. So thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it.